Live from San Francisco, celebrating 10 years of high-tech coverage, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2019. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. Live CUBE coverage at VMworld 2019. We're here in San Francisco, California. Moscone North Lobby, two sets. Our 10th year covering VMworld and our 10th year of, of, of our seasons of covering B2B enterprise tech. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, Stu and Justin Warren, breaking down day two CUBE Insights segment. Um, Dave, Stu, you, Stu, you were on set, Valley set, this is the meadow set, because it's got the scene, a bit of chirping birds behind us. Um, Justin, you've been doing some interviews out on the floor as well, checking the stories out. All the news is out. Day one was all the big corporate stuff. Today was the product technology news. Uh, Stu, I'll go to you first. What's the assessment on your take on VMware? Obviously, they're reinventing themselves. Jerry Chen, who we interviewed, said this is act three of VMware. They keep on adding more and more products to their core. Your thoughts on what's going on? Yeah, here. so the, the biggest story I've seen is the discussion of Tanzu, which really you're talking those cloud native applications. And if you break down VMware, it's like many companies have said, there's the you know, core product of the company. It is vSphere. It is the legacy uh, for what we have. And it's not going anywhere and it's changing. But you know, then there's the modernization, project specific. How do I bridge to the multi cloud? cloud world, how do I bridge? You know, Kubernetes is going to come into vSphere and do that, but then there's the application world, and it's the thing I'd been, you know, the existential threat to VMware I've been talking about forever is, if we sassify and cloudify and all the apps go away, the data centers disappear, and VMware dominant in the data center is left out in the cold. So, you know, Pivotal was driving down that, that path. They've done a lot of acquisitions, so love directionally where Tanzu's going. Time will tell whether they can play in that market. This is not a developer conference. We go to plenty of developer yeah. events. So, you know, that's, you know, some of the places I see, um, you know, and, and, and still, you know, It's an great operator event. conference, yeah. you're right, exactly right. And Justin, I want to get your thoughts too, because you've been blogging heavily on this topic as well as DevOps in general and commenting yeah. on theCUBE. You know, the, real, you know, the reality uh, and, and the reality of the situation from the, the announcements, I'm not going to say vapor because they're doing some demos, um, and they're real product directions. Mm -hmm. So product directions is always what VMware does, and it's not something that they're shameful of, it's what they do. They, it's what they software real companies do. Yeah. They put out, it's not vapor either. They, companies. It's, a statement, <laughs> it's a statement of direction. Um, we were talking hybrid cloud in 2012 when I asked Pat Gelser, was a halfway house, he blew a gasket, and now five years later, the gestation period for hybrid was that. But yeah. VMware's happy to have the data center back in the back in the play here. Your thoughts on? Yeah, so this conference is, is I think, a refreshing return to form. So VMware is, as you say, this is an operators conference, and VMware is for operators. It's not for devs. There was a period there where cloud was scary, and, and it was all this cloud native stuff, and VMware tried to appeal to this new market, and I guess tried to dress up and, and as something that it really wasn't, and it, it didn't pull it off. And we didn't, it didn't feel right, and now VMware has decided that, well, no, actually, this is what VMware is about. And no one can be more VMware than VMware. So it's returned turning to being its best self. And, and I think we're seeing software that this too. Year. Again, software, they know software. They know software. So the, the addition of, of, of putting Project Tanzu in and having Kubernetes in there, and, and it's, it's to operate the software. So it's, it's going to be in there and apps will run on it, and they want to have Kubernetes baked into vSphere so that now, yeah, we'll have new, app, new apps, and yeah, they might be SaaS apps for the people who are consuming them, but they've got to run somewhere, and now we could run them on VMware, whether it's on site, at the edge, could be in the cloud, you know, VMware on AWS. Dave and, you have Stu, I, Dave and Stu, I want to get your thoughts. Justin, I want you to jump in too because you know, I love Pivotal, what they've done. I've always felt as a standalone company that they probably couldn't compete with Amazon to scale of what's going on and the other things. But bringing it back in the fold in VMware, you mentioned this in a couple of our interviews yesterday, Dave, and Stu, you illuminated to the, to the fact of you know, the cloud native world coming together. It's better inside VMware because they can package Pivotal and not have to bet the ranch on an outcome in the marketplace where there's highly competitive statements out there. So you got the, the business value of Pivotal, the upside now can be managed. Stu, your thoughts first and then I'll go to Dave. Um, is it about Pivotal, yeah. It As an integrated, integrated is better for the industry than trying to bet the ranch on a pure play. Right, so John, yesterday we, we had a little discussion about hybrid and multi-cloud and it's still early about there, but uh, the conversation of PaaS five years ago was very different from the discussion today. Uh, Docker had a ripple effect with containers and VMware is addressing that and it made sense for Pivotal to come home, if you will. They still have the Pivotal Labs group, 
app that can work with customers going through that transformation and a number of other pieces to uh, put together. Uh, but yeah, VMware is doing a, a, a good enough job to give customers the comfort that we can move you forward to the cloud, you don't have to abandon us, and especially all those people that do VMware is, yeah. they don't have to be frozen where they are. Hey, business value. Well, I think you got to start with the transaction and provide a historical context. So this goes back to what I used to call the misfit toys. The Federation, David Goulden's taking bits and pieces of, 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 String of, pearls. of assets inside of EMC and VMware and then creating pivotal out of whole cloth. Then they did an IPO. Michael Dell maintained 70% uh, ownership of the company and 96% and voting shares, floated the, the, the stock, stock didn't do well, bought it back on 50 cents on the dollar as to what the IPO price was, and then took a, got a, brought back a $4 billion asset inside of VMware and paid $900 million for it. So it's a, just a brilliant financial transaction. Now, having said all that, what is the business value of this? You know, when I come to these shows, I like to compare what they say in the messaging and the keynotes to what practitioners are saying. And the practitioners last night were saying a couple things. First of all, they're concerned about all this M&A. Like, one practitioner said to me, look, if it weren't for all these acquisitions that they announced last minute, what would we be hearing about here? Yeah. It would have been NSX and vSAN again. So there's sort of little concerns there. Some of the practitioners I talked to were really concerned about integration. Now they've done a good job with Nasira, uh, but some of the other acquisitions that they made have taken longer to integrate and customers are, are concerned. And we've seen this move before. We saw it at EMC, we certainly saw it at Dell, we're seeing it again now at VMware. VMware, while they're very good at integrating companies, um, sometimes that catches up to you. The last thing I'll say is we've been pushing, you just mentioned it, uh, Justin, on, on devs, not a dev show, Pivotal gives VMware the opportunity to whether it's a, a different show or, or an event within the event to actually attract the devs, but I would say in the multi-cloud world, VMware's sitting in a good position with the exception of developers. Pivotal, I think, is designed to solve that problem. Yeah. Justin, so, your thoughts. Do you, do you think that VMware is, is at risk of becoming a portfolio company just like EM, EMC was? Because it oh, certainly it, looks at, at the moment to me, like we look at all the different names for things and I just look at the brand architecture of stuff. There are too many brands, there are too many product names, it's too confusing. And there, there's going to have to be a cull at some point just to make it understandable for customers. Otherwise we're just going to end up with this endless sprawl and we saw what the damage that did at places like AMC. It's a great point and, and, and Joe, Joe Tucci used to say um, that overlap is better than gaps and I, and I agree with him to a point, mm. you know, better until it's not. And then Michael Dell came in and Jeff Clark came in and said, look, if we're going to compete with Amazon's cost structure, we have to clean this mess up and that's what they've been doing. They've been doing a lot of hard work on that. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, they do risk that. I think if they don't do that integration, it's hard to do that integration. As you know, yeah. it takes time. Um, and so I, right now, all looks good, right? Right down the middle, as you'd say, John. All right, multi-cloud, big topic. Gestation period is going to take five years to seven years. When's the reality multi-cloud? I had a debate on Twitter last night. Someone's saying, oh, I'm doing multi-cloud today. I mean, we had Gelsinger lay out the definition of multi-cloud. Well, he laid out his definition his of multi-cloud. His definition. Everyone likes to define it. It's, it's funny how, and we mentioned this as Stu and I earlier on the other set, uh, Cloud, we're still arguing about what cloud means. Like, so, oh, is it multi cloud? Which kind of multi cloud? Is it hybrid? Blah, blah, blah. And then you compare that to edge computing. Edge computing was always going on, and then someone just came along and gave it a name, and everyone just went, huh, okay, and got on with their lives. And it's like, why is cloud so different and difficult for people to agree on what the thing is? There's a lot of money being made and lost, that's why. Well, right. The, the, the thing I've said is for multi cloud to be a real thing, it needs to be more valuable to a customer than the sum of its pieces. Uh, and you know, we, we know we're going to be at Amazon reInvent later this year. Um, we will not be talking, uh, you know, well they will not be talking multi-cloud, we might be, be, be talking about it. Um, uh, but They'll be hinting to hybrid cloud. Well, they they, they oh, may they, or may they, not say that. But yeah. you know, hybrid well. is okay in their world with outposts and everything they're doing and they're partnering with VMware. Um, but you know, the point I've been looking at here is you know, management of multi-vendor 
was atrocious. And you know, why do we think we're going to do any better? Dave, when yeah. you hired me nine years ago, it yeah. was like I could spend my entire career saying management stinks and security needs to be, you know, it's a solid. <laughs> so I want to share Floyer's definition he published on Wikibon on multi-cloud. Multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, he put them, put them together as true hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Any application or application service can run on any node of the hybrid cloud without rewriting, recompiling, or retesting. True hybrid cloud architectures have a consistent set of hardware, software services, APIs with integrated network security data and control planes that are native to and display the characteristics of public cloud infrastructure as a service. These attributes can be identically resident on other hybrid nodes independent of location, for example, including on public clouds, on-prem, or at the edge. That ain't happening. Yeah. It's just not, yeah. unless you have Outpost, Cloud a Customer, Azure Stack, okay, and you're going to have collections of those. So that vision that, that he laid out, I, I just, well, I think and, it's going to be. And David, it's, it's interesting, because you know, David and I have some good debates on this. I said, tell me a company that has been better at, than VMware about taking a stack and Letting it live on multiple hardwares. You know, I've got some of the scars. I wrote a big piece last weekend talking about you know when we had to check the BIOS of everything and when Blade servers rolled out. You know, getting VMware to work 15 years ago was really tough. Getting VMware to work today, uh, you but know, the problem is easy. you're going to have outposts. Yeah. You're going to have project dimensions installed. You're going to have Azure stacks installed. You're going to have roll your own out there, and so yeah, yeah. VMware is going to work on all of those. And, and it's not going to be a static situation because you know when I talk to customers and if they're using using VMware Cloud on AWS. It's not a lift and shift and leave it. They're going to modernize their things. They're going to start using services from the public cloud, and they might migrate some of these off of the VMware environment, which I think is the, the, the thing that I am talking to customers and hearing about that it's, you know, none of these situations are, oh, I just put it there and it's going to live there for years. It's constantly moving and changing, and that is a major threat to VMware's multi-cloud so strategy. My question is, is it technically feasible without just insanely high degrees of homogeneity. That's, that's the question. No, I, I don't think it is. And I, I don't think it's a reasonable thing to expect anyway, because any enterprise, you have any M&A activity, and all of a sudden you've got more than one. That, that's always been true, and it will always be true. So if someone else makes a different choice and you buy them, then well, now I've got both. So maybe that's not a fair definition. But that's kind of what, what one could infer. I think the, the, the industry is implying that that is hybrid multi-cloud because the, that's the nirvana that everybody wants. Yeah, the only situation I can see where that could maybe come true would be in something like Kubernetes, where you're running things on, as an abstraction on top of everything else. And that, that is a common abstraction that everyone agrees on and, and builds upon, but we're already seeing how that works out in well, real life. But, but if I'm using Ant, Google Anthos, I can't easily move it to PKS or OpenShift. Uh, there's right. things, it's Kubernetes, as Joe Beta says, is not a magic layer and everybody builds on top of because that. Because it turns out it's actually not that easy. Well, and plus people are taking open source code and then they're forking it mm. and then building their own proprietary <laughs> systems and saying, hey, here's our greatest thing. Well, the, the, to, the, to the credit of CNCF, uh, Kubernetes does have a, a kind of standardized agreed yeah, no, on thing sure. so right. to get away, away yeah. from that particular issue. So that's why it stands a better chance than say, unfortunately, OpenStack. So, because we saw a bit of that changing of, of the, we, we want to go this way and we want to go that way, so there's a lot of zigging and zagging. At least with Kubernetes, you have a kind of common framework, but even just the implementation of that yeah, and right, so operating it, it's really I, mean, I, I love Kubernetes. I think I've been a big fan of Kubernetes from day one. I think it's a great industry initiative. Having it the way it's rolling out is looking very good. I like it a lot. The comments that we heard on the Cube, which supports some of my things that I'm looking at is for CNCF's KubeCon coming, KubeCon coming up, is what happens with Knative and Istio, because mm. that's where, you're going to start to see the battleground form above Kubernetes. You're going to see that's where the differentiation is going. That's where the, the, the vendors are going to start to differentiate who they are. So I think Kubernetes is going to be a great thing, and I think what I learned here was the virtualization underneath Kubernetes doesn't matter. If you want to run a lot of VMs, if you're at scale, no big deal, run Kubernetes on top. If you want to run it on bare metal, God bless you, go for it. So I think that, there's use cases for both. That's why I particularly like Tanzu, is because for those customers who want to have a bit of this Kubernetes, I don't want to run it myself, it's too hard. But if I trust VMware to be able to run that and to upgrade it and to give me all of the goodness about operating it in the same way that I do VMware, again, we're at an ops show. So now I can have the stuff I already know and love and I can add some Kubernetes on top of it. Well, all right, but who's going to mess up multi-clouds too? <laughs> who's well, the one all, vendor? I'm not even saying it exists, so you can't mess up no, something that doesn't, no, who's gonna, doesn't exist. This vision, this vision of multi-cloud that the entire industry is putting forth, 
Who's going to throw a monkey in the wrench? Which vendor well, is going to screw it up? So, you know, licensing usually can cause issues. Uh, you know, our, our friend Corey Quinn wrote a nice article about Microsoft's licensing changes uh, there. Uh, you know, what's, they are a What's Amazon's player. play is right. my point. But, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Amazon is going to make it very They're not going to screw up multi-cloud because they're not in the multi-cloud exactly. well, game. Well, but, but, but yet, how can you do multi-cloud without Amazon? Well, they, right. they well, play with Amazon's Amazon's going to control Dave, right. the, my, the, the chessboard on this. My, my line has been, Amazon is in every multi-cloud because if you've got multiple clouds, there's a you know much greater yeah. than likely chance. That I they are have an in opinion on this. My feeling is, uh, in looking at the history of how multi-vendor evolved from uh, the IT industry, from proprietary network operating systems, mini computers, to open systems, with TCP, IP, web, et cetera, what's going on now is very interesting. And I think the CISOs are the, are the canary in the coal mine, not CIOs, because they like multi-vendor, they want multiple clouds, they're comfortable with that, they got the staff for that. CISOs have pressure, security. They're the canary in the coal mine, and all the CISOs that I talk to are all saying multi-cloud's BS, because they're building stacks internally, and they want to create their own technology for security reasons, and then build APIs and make APIs the supplier relationship, and mm. saying, hey supplier, if you want to work with me, support my stack. And I think that is an interesting indication. What that means is that the entire multi-cloud thing means we're going to pick one cloud and build on, have a backup, we'll deal with multiple clouds if there's workloads in there, but primary one cloud will be there, and I think that's going to be the model. Yes, there'll be multiple clouds. If you got Azure and you got Office 365, that's technically multi-cloud. But I want to make a point, so, and you've, you, when Pat's on, we, we joke about the, the cul-de-sac, his hybrid cloud at cul-de-sac, and, and you, you, you've been very respectful and basically saying, yeah, Pat, okay, blah, 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 you were right. Really? What, what's hybrid? Well, show me a hybrid cloud. It, it's taken all this time to gestate. You, where are you seeing federated applications? It's, yeah, it's just not don't. happening. You have on-prem workloads, and you have a company that has public cloud workloads, but they're not well, well, hybrid as the original. And some will talk about it, but even multi, it is an application per cloud, or a couple of clouds that you'll do it, but it's right. The, the follow the sun thing that we might okay, have talked then, about right. 15 years ago is and not something. And you're going to have there's consistent. There's data moving around in some clouds, And are you going to have consistent that. security, yeah, and governance, and, and all the organizational edicts across all those platforms? Uh, the one place I could I'll see it for that. eventually, and this is a long way off, would be if you go with serverless, where it's all functions. And now it's about service composition, and mm -hmm. I don't care where it lives. I'm just consuming a service because I have some data that I want to go and process, and Google happens to have the best machine learning that I need to do it on that data, awesome, I'll use that service. And then when I actually want to run the workload and host it somewhere else, I drop it into a CDN with an application that happens to run in AWS. Okay guys, wrapping Bye. up day two, but I just got to ask, what is that animal? It must be an influencer, because it hasn't said a word. <laughs> <laughs> this is the famous blue cow, she travels everywhere with me. <laughs> and has an Instagram account? She used to have an Instagram, She now she doesn't, she just uses my, uh, my Twitter account Justin, from time to time. I learned a lot about you right now. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> great to have you, great as always, great commentary, thanks for coming. We have day, day three tomorrow. Tomorrow I want to dig into what's in this for Dell Technologies. What's the play there? We're going to unpack that tomorrow on day three. Eight billions. If there's no multi-cloud <laughs> and there's a big TAM out there, what's in it for Michael Dell and VMware, it's crown jewel as the main ingredient. Guys, thanks for coming to Stu Miniman, Justin Warren, Dave Vellante, I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching day two insight coverage here. Our wrap up, thanks for watching. <laughs>